Good morning and welcome, members and friends of Cornerstone Bible Church. Do you listen to these opening thoughts? Watching these every week with you, I wish I could speak without reading, looking right at you like a news anchor, seeking to communicate in a more engaging way. But while seeking to improve, I'm more concerned about us learning to move toward and through touchy issues, seeking to help the normal process of a Christian's life of repentance, changing the way we approach God and live before Him. So how have you done living and growing as kingdom representatives during this time away from corporate worship and regular interaction with each other? Have you taken the time to read some of the articles suggested from Nine Marks or the Gospel Coalition concerning our spiritual response to the coronavirus? How about the one referred to on Wednesday night, Watch Your Knowledge Diet in the COVID-19 Crisis by Brett McCracken? Have you been conscious of how cynicism with the media and much alone time contributes to trusting in our own judgments, making us rather ill-prepared to resume our mission as a local church together? Our time to be completely apart is quickly coming to an end, and this will either be the last or next to last pre-recorded service. We'd like to begin next week, but think we perhaps need another week to prepare for the transfer back to something similar to what we did the last week when we gathered in March. We hope to put a plan and tentative guidelines together this week and ask for your prayers, patience, and input as we seek to move forward. It is very important that we remember that to profess to be born again means that we have one source of life and one corporate responsibility, to be conformed to the image of Christ and to display his character to the world as the collected people of God. As such, we once again continue with our best attempt to keep continuity in our worship among the scattered people of God at Cornerstone Bible Church. Pastor John once again continues with James 1. Kindly open your Bibles to the book of James, the first chapter. I'm going to begin reading at verse 12, down through our text this morning, verse 21. James 1, verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good th thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness, and all that remains of wickedness in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Amen. Count on trials and testing as part of your life down here. Joy is one of the fitting emotions during these trials for the Christian. This joy arises not from the trial itself, but from the opportunity the trial brings to produce a strengthened and enduring faith which accomplishes heaven's purposes. You're not sure how to handle these trials because your emotions eclipse what God desires for you to value and do during these times? Well, then ask God. He is the source of wisdom, gives it generously over and over to those who ask. Do you believe this? You must ask in faith, trusting he hears you, he loves to answer, that he loves those who come to him through Christ. If you don't trust him this way, you're 
you will lack foundation. And you will find yourself saying right words, but still seeking your own protection and direction. Therefore, look farther. Don't give up. Keep going. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Why? Once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, the crown which is life for those who love him, who see him as precious. Yet while we're in this world, sin dims, distorts, and distracts, causing us to live short-sighted, even to the extent of blaming God for asking too much and for placing us in seemingly unlivable environments. Don't think this way. This is not the character of God. Study the depths of the trajectory of sin. Shudder, then look again to God. Last week we were reminded that God is the source of all good. He is the true one, the faithful one, not us or anything or one else. So much for us so far in James 1. Do you live inside the boundaries of these words? If you see how many false exits lie just in these few verses, you will carefully heed the warnings given today. But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to think the final word lies with you, making you sloppy listening to God and others, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Your emotions and your responses tell much about you. Watch your final judgment shown by your anger, your disgust, or even an unwillingness to listen to those that you don't think measure up to your standards. Even when frustrated that others don't think correctly and act wisely, remember that even if you're correct, you don't measure up to the righteous precision called for in God's world. But stop looking at yourself. Don't see yourself as just and as the final word. Christian, Look to your living head. He is righteous and worthy of worship. looking at him. I try, but they don't make it easy. My thoughts and desires don't make it easy. Well, you must put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Can you do this? The right answer is no. 
you can't feel the weight of sin seen from the perspective of the holy God of the Bible. And I feel a little bit raw, perhaps defensive, helpless under its pervasiveness, perhaps even a little dirty. When you truly feel this way about sin, there will be less blame on others, less focusing on other sins and injustices against you, and more recognizing your need for help. Don't carry your guilt. Don't keep looking at the sin. Acknowledge it and your inability to overcome it. Then 1 John 1, 9 style, confess it. Then come to your 1 John 2, 1 advocate before the Father. This is the hope of the gospel in the face of sin. Remember, when you ask God to search you, 
He doesn't search you to find you worthy. If you are truly His, (laughs) you are worthy. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 15, 22? For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Professing Christian, live the gospel by trusting Christ's death to pay sin's penalty. And trust not your performance, your trying to please Him for fellowship with God, but trust the righteousness of God placed on your account. How does this live? Well, look to God, confess your sin, and take the next right step according to the ways of the kingdom of God, using the means of God, grace God has given to live life dependent on Him. And then remember, you are not saved to look at your success or failure, but to proclaim His excellencies. He is able, and it is His will to help you live inside these words from James. Humbly acknowledge this and praise Him.
Let us bow before this Holy One. Let us pray. Father, once again we gather together, though apart. Father, we thank you that you are here, you are everywhere. With each one, Father, at this time who is seeking to worship you, you have promised a meeting with each of those individuals. And Father, as we come and realize once again the holiness of you, we cannot see, we cannot understand from within our own sinfulness the greatness of your love, the willingness that you are so desirous of us coming to worship you. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. For the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ alone that is able to wash us clean. Guilt removed. The stain covered. No condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And to you goes all the glory. The wisdom of the plan, the accomplishment of it, and the present reality and the assurance as your spirit within the believer bears witness and assurance that we are sons and daughters, children of yours. Hallelujah, God. There's nothing like it. And it is a forever relationship. And so we thank you and we praise you. And we thank you for this, in a sense, another Lord's Day as we come to worship. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Over five million now around the world have contacted this disease, this plague. Father, thank you. Thank you in the fact that we are able to worship. Thank you in the fact that personally, I'm not aware of any of our church family here who has that disease at this time. Lord, that could change. And I want to pray, may your perfect will be done. And Father, to recognize your grace and your mercy and your faithfulness as you sustain us from day to day. And Father, we are looking ahead a couple of weeks. Hopefully by then we'll be able to meet once again in this building. We do pray for our president. Father, as he makes statements, some in contradiction with some of our governors, as governors make statements, often the populace of those states very much again what a number of them have said. And Father, the divisiveness politically, the divisiveness economically within our land continues to accentuate and show itself. And Father, we recognize that there will not be peace on this earth. Your word, word makes it so clear there is no peace for the wicked. And Father, we pray for your peace for the believers as we are supposed to have it. May we realize it, Father. Give us a love for the family of God. But give us a love also for those outside the family still. That they might come to know and be part of us. Not necessarily cornerstone at all, but worldwide, Father, part of your great bride for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for that. Where we have contact, where we have ones who worship with us or come and attend our services, Father, who are not yet born again, our heart cries out, Lord, such a time as this, how purposeful and special it could be for ones to cry out to you for salvation. And once again, as we've had death this past week in various forms, run through our church families, acquaintances, and family. We're mindful again, dear God, of how quickly eternity can come. And so teach us, as your word says, to number our days, that we may prepare before you and have a heart full of wisdom from you to live lives in accordance with your will. Again, we thank you for some who have gone back to work this week. We thank you that things are opening up in many ways. We thank you for successful surgery this week. We have some upcoming surgeries in the next couple of weeks. 
Thank you, Father, for our prayer sheet as we are to be reminded to pray for one another. And Lord, that we would continue to share one another's burdens so that we might bear one another's burdens. And Father, we praise you and thank you for that opportunity. So here we are, Lord. Here we are now as we come to the end of May 2020. And what a past two and a half months it's been. Who would have thought this as we entered this year? But Lord God, you are in control. And so we come and worship. You, our God, our King, our Lord. We worship you and we thank you for the privilege. We commit the service into your hands now, asking once again, as so needed, Lord, that it would not be mechanical, that it would not just be something on TV that we can come and go from, turn off, turn on, but that we would be tuned into you and even through the means of the modern technology. But Father, tuned in so that your Holy Spirit would override everything else in speaking to us individually, as well as corporately, as well as nationally, as well as within the world. And so we praise you. The service is yours as we offer it to you. We come to worship now, and we thank you as we pray once again in the Messiah's name, in the Lord Jesus' name, in the King of Kings' name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I ask you to join me as we read in preparation for this morning's message from James from the 119th Psalm. We'll be reading from verse 73 through verse 96. Your hands made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. May those who fear you see me and be glad because I wait for your word. I know, O oh Lord, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Oh, may your loving kindness comfort me according to your word to your servant. May your compassion come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be ashamed, for they subvert me with a lie, but I shall meditate on your precepts. May those who fear you turn to me, even those who know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statutes so that I will not be ashamed. My soul languishes for your salvation. I wait for your word. My eyes fail with longing for your word, while I say, when will you comfort me? Though I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your statutes. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? The arrogant have dug pits for me, men who are not in accord with your law. All your commandments are faithful. They have persecuted me with a lie. Help me. They almost destroyed me on earth. But as for me, I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness, so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. Amen. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. What does your intake of God's word show about you knowing your place? Not just your time reading, the way you meditate on it. Where do your thoughts linger? How about your willingness to allow others to interact with what you've read and hold you to that word? We are slowly making our way through the scripture in our scripture readings. 
So far, we've only repeated passages three times in the last four and a half years. And today's reading is our third in Psalm 119, leaving us with still more than half of this psalm left. What would it look like to meditate on these words and live them, let alone think them on your own to write them? Christian, you were meant to live by the Word of God. Remember this as Pastor John preaches this convicting passage. From the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise of your word. Words of power strong to save that will never pass away. I will stand on every promise of your Your covenant is sure, and that this I am secure. I can stand on every promise of your word. When I stumble and I sin, condemnation pressing in, I will stand on every promise of your word. You are faithful to forgive, that in freedom I might live. So I stand on every promise of your word. Heal to win, I'll stand to restore, you remember sins no more. So I'll stand on every promise. And I'll stand on every promise of your word. Through this dark and troubled land, you will guide me with your hand. As I stand on every promise of your word. And you promise to complete every word we God in I'll stand on every promise of your word. Hope that lifts me from despair, love that casts out every fear. As I stand on every promise of your word, not forsaken, not alone, for the comforter. And I stand on every promise of your word. Grace of vision, grace for me, grace for all who will be. We will stand on every promise of your word. Once again, I would ask you to open up your copy of that very word, the word of God. And we turn once again to the book of James, the first chapter. James chapter 1. I look out upon an almost empty church. And once again, I have tried before the service here and even now to visualize various ones of you who are not here. But may God's word, as only he can deliver it, reach each of our hearts. And so let us pray. Father, a holy time as we meet with you and a holy special time as we open up your word. And Father, you have something for each one who has ears physically, but more than that, spiritually to hear. 
And so, Father, I commit this time into your hands now to have your way with us, that we would understand a little bit more about who you are, but also what it is to be a child of yours, to be born again, and to recognize that with that relationship comes responsibilities and how we live it out, how we respond. Speak now, dear God, I ask, in the power and name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sometimes it is good to review the basics. I've been working with my lawnmowers, been working with my weed whackers, and I've gone back to the manuals to review some of the basics. We all need the basics more and more, I realize. And not necessarily for your lawnmower or weed whacker, but for your knowledge and walk with God. It was July of 1961. 38 members of the Green Bay Packers football team gathered together for the first day of training camp. The previous season had ended with a heartbreaking defeat, although not for many of you Pennsylvanians. But the Green Bay Packers had been leading in the fourth quarter, towards the end of the fourth quarter, and yet they lost the championship to the Philadelphia Eagles. Coach Vince Lombardi, now on the first day of training camp, took nothing for granted. He began a tradition of starting from scratch, assuming that the players were blank slates who carried over no knowledge from just the year before. And so he began that very famous training season with a simple acknowledgement as he held up in his right hand this is a football. They are professional football players. They've played midget football, junior high football, most of them, if not all of them, high school football, college football, and pros, and just lost the championship game. And he starts out, this is a football, gentlemen. Lombardi's methodical coverage of the fundamentals continued throughout that training camp blocking, tackling the basic techniques. Max McGee, an all-pro wide receiver on that Packer team, he broke into the teaching of the coach. And he shared something like this. Uh, coach, could you slow down just a little bit? You're going too fast for us. <laughs> he had begun on play number one, page one, of the book, the basics, the basics, the basics, and pounded it home. <laughs> Coach Lombardi cracked the smile, but it didn't stop him. On the basics, he continued. That year, that team would go on to win the championship game, beating my team, the New York Giants, 37 to nothing. Basics. James as we continue our study, gets pretty basic. I, I know these things would be the easy thing to say from within. But here we continue. In a sense, there's nothing earth-shaking in this message. Just the basics that need to be pounded home. Do you call yourself a Christian, or do you want to know what it is to be a Christian? We're going to look at some very basic Fundamental steps of how to live out our Christianity. Now as we look at our text, verse 19 begins, This you know. Now we're not certain that's actually what it says. As a matter of fact, in the margin of the New American Standard tradition, uh, Translation, excuse me, it says, Know this. Know this. What's the big deal? Well, the way the New American Standard reads to start out, this you know, it's a declarative sentence. If it's know this, it's a command. We don't know which. In actuality, the Holy Spirit gave James to write to us. But I share, or maybe I should say I declare to you, a few basics that as Christians 
we need to put in, even as commands, that we might follow them and live in our lives. Once again, it's beloved brethren. Once again, it's a reminder of what it is to be a Christian. It's one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. Yes, it has to come that way. But it doesn't continue that way. You become part of family, a beloved family, the family of God. And we are to be seen as brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ when we are born again. So this morning, let us look at four basics for the believer in Jesus Christ. First of all, be quick to hear. Uh, be quick to hear those around you. Learn to be a good listener. Uh, there they were. They were sitting at the dinner table. It was a family. It was lively at that table with the children and the parents and the conversation flowing louder and louder on and on it went. They heard their little brother pass the potatoes. Mom was shocked. How rude for him to just shout it out like that. And so immediately he was sent to his room. Well, the meal continued without little brother. But at the end and towards the evening, dad shared with the family, I've got a confession to make. Uh, this happened about 40 years ago. He, he said, I, I, I purchased a little uh, tape recorder and I've tape recorded the, the whole meal and the conversation. I thought it might be interesting for us to hear it. And so he turned it on. And there they heard the loudness as the brothers and sisters back and forth bantered as they continued with their meal. And then they heard a little voice. Would someone please pass me the potatoes? And the noise went on. It was louder and louder. A little bit later, could someone please, please pass me the potatoes? And the noise continued back and forth. And finally it was, potatoes! <laughs> yeah, he had never been heard, the little brother, and got frustrated and finally got as loud as he could to outdo the others. Be quick to hear, to listen. The world is looking for good listeners. It has well been said, and for a lot of reasons, that often the bars are filled at 5 p.m. or whenever after work because of people just wanting the beverage, yes, I'm sure, but someone to just listen to them, to hear where they're at. I've been told it's sort of like the barber shops as well. Everything gets said. The needs as people pour out their minds and their hearts, their longings and their frustrations. Be quick to hear those around you. Kistemaker in his commentary says, it takes effort. It takes effort, I quote, to make an intense interest in the person who is speaking. An intense interest in the person who is speaking. It's hard to listen, especially when you've got so much to say. I mean, our two cents worth, which we have overinflated to a much higher value, it just has to be said. So please get on with it so that I can say what I want to say. It takes effort and energy and heart to be willing to get involved in the life of others and to learn to feel with them as they share where they're at. It takes effort to listen, to bypass our preconceived ideas which come too easily to us. I'm reminded of a general who was visiting a military base and he asked for the opportunity to meet with the bugler. And so he met with the bugler in private, and he asked the bugler, he says, can you play fire call? The bugler said yes. So the general told him, I'd like for you to meet me at 5 o'clock in the morning. The CO, the commanding officer of the post, saw the general pull the bugler aside. and He pressed him. He wanted to know, what, what did he ask you? And so he found out what had been said. Well, that night, the base was very busy, cleaning up the fire engine and making sure that everything was spotless and ready to go. The night was very short. Five o'clock in the morning, there was a bugler. 
he met the general. And the general asked him, excuse me, the general commanded him, I want you to play church call. But I thought you asked if I could play fire call. Yes, I did. But I want you to play church call. The bugler lifted his instrument and he began to play. And as soon as the first notes came out, the doors of the firehouse opened up. Out came the fire truck, bells and sirens and everything else. And boy, was their embarrassment when they realized they had presumed that it was going to be fire call. They hadn't listened to what was being played. No, it should be clear. We need to work on our energies of learning to just listen, to hear what is being said. It should be clear that what we listen to should be good and clean and upbuilding, not trash or filth. From that, we need to learn how to close our ears and move away, perhaps saying something before we do so. Be quick to hear those around you. But more than that, be quick to hear the voice of God. Notice from verse 18, and we'll talk about verse 18 in a few moments once again, but you notice uh, here, he brought us forth by the word of truth. The word of God is the word of truth, and we need to learn how to listen for the word of truth. You remember Samuel, you boys and girls remember him. Samuel, the little boy who had been prayed for and came as a later blessing for mom and dad, and he was given back into the service of God as he served under the priest, Eli. And you recall what happened there. And it's interesting, as you read in, in 1 Samuel, we are told in that context there that the voice of the Lord was rare. They weren't used to hearing the voice of the Lord in those days. No, maybe I should say, are we used to listening to the word of the Lord? No, I haven't heard him audibly, as I don't believe any of you have as such. But do you hear the word of the Lord coming through the word? Do you hear him as you're singing? Do you hear him as you're thinking? That voice, that still small voice on the inside. Well, for Samuel, you recall, there was that night. In the middle of night, he heard, Samuel, Samuel. And he thought it was Eli, and so he, he ran next door to Eli, and what, what do you want? I didn't call for you. Go back to sleep again. And it happened a second time. Samuel, I didn't call you. And finally, Eli caught on, and he instructed Samuel. So when the voice came the next time, Samuel, the response was, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Your servant is hearing. Your servant is at your disposal. Speak, Lord. I want to hear what you have to say. In Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 3, Isaiah, by the Holy Spirit, writes, Listen, listen that your soul may live. That is a command. Listen. It's a command with a promise that your soul may live. Are you looking for life? The abundant life now that God promises as well as eternal life? We need to listen to what he has to say. And to understand. We need to take every opportunity to come under the hearing of God's word. I remind you, if you listen with the right attitude, if you're looking for what God has for you, you will hear, you will find, you will see, and you will receive a blessing. Hebert in his commentary shares, to listen eagerly is the first duty of discipleship. The first responsibility of being a disciple is to listen. Jesus often said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We need to be quick to hear. It wasn't that many years ago when a leader of a large college ministry shared this with a friend. Quote, I get the sinking feeling that no one is really listening anymore. No one is really listening anymore. Even now in the days of this virus, when over 5 million have been infected worldwide. And the USA is up there in position number one, a position we'd rather not be in. But how many? Yes, praise God for those who are. There are some. 
but how many are really listening? God, what are you trying to say? What do you have for us? Far too often we think we know all there needs to know, and we've already made up our minds, and so we do not listen. What can you tell me? I already know this. I'm well off. The word of God commands, be quick to hear. One of the things that is used to measure one's health. Yes, as I went to the dentist this morning, the first thing they did to me basically was wash your hands and they took my temperature. But one of the things we often check out is, how's your appetite? Are you hungry? Well, that's a good test for a spiritual relationship. Are you hungry for the word of God? Are you looking to listen? Do you want to listen? Do you want to hear? Again, it often shows where we're at as far as spiritual health is concerned as well. Be quick to hear. Second, be slow to speak. Uh, That doesn't mean you have to come from the south and speak slowly with a drawl, but restrain yourself from speaking at all. Be slow to speak. Be slow to speak, for the dangers are many. The dangers are many. Proverbs 17, verse 28. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is considered prudent. Again, if nothing comes out, you can't say anything dumb. If nothing comes out, you can't put your foot in your mouth. I'm learning about that far too often. Proverbs 10, verse 19. When there are many words, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. When the mouth speaks too quickly, when the mouth speaks too much, it's basically impossible to not sin. We'll look at that a little bit more in detail and depth when we get into James chapter 3 and so forth. But for now, just a couple of thoughts. How easy it is to boast and to overpromise. The rabbis, I believe back in the days of James, uh, they shared this. The righteous speaks little and does much. The wicked speak much and does nothing. Perhaps we think of our politicians far too often. But maybe we need to also think about ourselves. The righteous speaks little and does much. The wicked speak much and does nothing. It's too easy to gossip and to share items. And it's not wrong to share. How else can we pray? How else can we know? But to share items where no good will come of it, where no one can or is willing to do anything about it. And just to pass on to make ourselves look good because we know the input or whatever it might be. It's too easy to speak and to lose control so that we swear or off-color talk. Loss of control of that tongue. The filth that comes out far too easy, and a number of you know, maybe all of us know what I'm talking about. We need to be slow to speak. We need to be careful that we speak the truth because it's too easy to tell lies. And the problem with telling lies is once you're caught as a liar, well then how do I know that you're telling me the truth? I've often been seen as being naive because I like to take people at face value. What they say to me, I believe, until I find out that they've lied. And it's very difficult, you know. It's very difficult then to win back trust. How do I know this time you're telling the truth? Oh, because I am. Really? Really? We want to make sure we tell the truth. And most of you young people can tell your parents what Pastor John says. You know, it's like reducing fractions. When do you tell the truth? (laughs) Always, always. Always. It's too easy to speak, for the dangers are many. To complain, to gripe, murmur against circumstances, to complain against God. And we saw that. God, you've given me the short end of the stick. I remind you that we speak, the Lord Jesus said, out of the abundance of our heart. Out of the abundance of our heart. We show once again what our heart is really like. Do the words of Jesus come out? Are they good? Are they kind? Be slow to speak, for the dangers are many. But also be slow to speak so you are sure of what you say. 
We don't learn much when we are speaking. We need to learn to listen. We've talked about that. I believe it was Abraham Lincoln who said this, better remain silent and be thought a fool than speak and remove all doubt. Better remain silent and be thought a fool than speak and remove all doubt. Nathan, you recall, Nathan who was there to lead David, to help David, to be his, God's spokesman for David. David shared his heart. He was seeing his own palace, his own house, and so forth being built, and he wanted to do something for God. And so he shared that with Nathan, and Nathan very quickly said, hey, that's a great idea. Go right ahead. But that very night, the Lord spoke to Nathan, and Nathan was quick to hear. Nathan, you spoke too quickly. That's not my desire for David to do. His hands are filled with blood. Yes, he's a man after my own heart, but he's not the one. His son Solomon, his son will build for me a house. God had to correct Nathan. He spoke too quickly. I can remember back in seminary, one of the things we were taught there as pastors, as preachers, don't preach beyond your level of growth and commitment to the Lord, or else you're a phony, or else you'll be found to be a fool. You don't know what you're talking about. In James chapter 3, we'll come to that in time, but uh, let not many of you become teachers. We will incur a stricter judgment. Again, we need to be careful as we speak in the name of the Lord. We need to be knowing where our hearts are at, where our own commitment is at, so that we are honest with that, but then that we speak that which we believe because we have studied and we're ready to share something. I would share this in sharing with others don't keep your mouth shut because you're afraid you don't know too much or you don't know enough. May I remind you what we have seen, what we've heard. That's what John writes, we declare unto you, what we've handled. That which we know about Jesus, what we've seen. You remember? No, I, I couldn't tell you the name of this man. But I can tell you this, once I was blind, now I can see. What am I saying? I'm saying... If you know Jesus and to be born again, you have to know Jesus. You, you may be just born again. You may be a babe in Christ. You may not have much theology. But I was fearful. I was anxious. I knew I was lost and going to hell. And now I believe the word of God. I asked Jesus to forgive me. And he says he has. I can share that. Let me tell you what I know about this Jesus and my walk with him. Whether it's two days of walking with him or it's 22 years of walking with him. Don't be embarrassed if you don't have the answers. That's a good question, what you ask me. I'm not sure about that. Let, let me do some homework. Let, 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 me, let me go looking in my Bible. Let me go talk to the pastor or someone, my parents or whoever it might be. I'll get back to you. And then be sure that you do. Be quick to hear. Be slow to speak. Third, be slow to anger. Boy, nothing new. Nothing dramatic, but to live it out. Again, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Wow. Simple, but profound, and needing to be worked on. Be slow to anger in life circumstances. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. To lose control, you're nothing more than a fool. Do not be eager to be angry. Some of us have more of a temper problem than others, but <laughs> our flesh is capable, all of us, to get us into trouble. You remember me at the pool table, and I blurted out a Norwegian when I was, I felt wronged again about going home. No. I played a lot of basketball in my day, and elbows where the referee couldn't see them, that hits you in the side or in the groin. The hand that holds onto your shorts when you're trying to make a fast cut, and I'm not fast, so anything would slow me down. <laughs> Easy to lose your temper, and a lot of people do. Working on the job, and the boss seems to be playing favorites, and you're always stuck with the dirty job. It's easy to get out of control. Parents with children, it's been a long day. 
for the nth, nth time, the umpteenth time. The kids have done it again. How many times have I told you, your muddy shoes, not across the floor that I just washed. How many times, your hands on the table, and you've knocked over the milk or the water or the juice or whatever again and again. It's easy to lose control. That's why we need to be careful once again. To be careful that we never ever discipline when we're about to lose control. No, we need to understand again how quickly disagreements can come and loss of temper can come. In Proverbs chapter 22, we're also told about who we hang around with. Well, let me just read that for you here. Proverbs 22, verse 24. Do not associate with a man given to anger. 22, 24. Do not associate with a man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. And you get yourself into a lot of trouble by hanging around the wrong people. Oh, share Jesus with them, but be careful. Be careful. Life circumstances, it's easy to lose it all. But also when you're feeling convicted, you might find it easy to get angry. Whether it's mom or dad who are on your case again as you see it, because you haven't been quick to hear, and you haven't followed through on what they've asked you to do. And now deep inside you know you're wrong, but pride won't allow you to admit it. And so you get angry. Why are you always yelling at me? You're always picking on me. What about my sister? What about my brother? What about when the Bible is preached? I like preaching through the Word of God. Not always easy, but verse by verse and line by line. I didn't choose this sermon for you. <laughs> you knew it was coming, you who are with us here regularly. But when it comes out from God's Word, be quick to hear, be slow to speak, be slow to anger. God knows our hearts. He knows what we need. No, you know that temper, loss of control, opens you up for Satan's opportunities. In Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes here in verse 26, Be angry, and yet do not sin. But then do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. When you're wrongfully angry, and especially when you lose control, yeah, well, it was back in 1651 that Thomas Manton, precious commentary, Thomas Manton, oh, so inclusive. But he shared this, nothing makes room for Satan more than wrath. Now that is his opinion. But as we read from Ephesians, it gives an opportunity for Satan to, to move in. And he doesn't need much. That's one of our concerns about opening up this building once again and coming together as a church. We are going to differ on how we see things. Where does the government fit in? Where does the president fit in? Where does the governor fit in? Where do the local municipalities, where do the other believers in Christ and how they handle it, where does all that fit in? We're going to disagree. We do not want to give Satan an opportunity to love one another, not to think more highly of yourself, not to look down on others because we disagree, but to search our hearts and see what God has for us individually and then corporately, and then to understand as we try to please our God most of all. Moses, we are told that he was meeker than any man, gentler in many ways. And yet, you recall, he felt, he acted, I can't take it anymore. Grumbling and complaining, grumbling and complaining. You got us out of Egypt so that we could die in the wilderness. The food we don't like, provided for. Nothing to drink. And you recall what happened. Finally, Moses said, enough is enough. You want water? I'll give it to you. He struck the rock. And for that one little loss of temper, for that one little taking it on himself, I'll give it to you. God said, you will not go into the promised land. Wow. 
Would I dare say, God, maybe you were a little bit tough on Moses? I definitely will say, God, I am so thankful you're not that tough on me. But you do hold me accountable. But I need to realize once again what a temper can do and what being out of control can do as well. No, we are told very clearly here about the anger of man, verse 20. Say, be slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. God's justice in a situation, his righteousness. We will not, by losing our tempers, accomplish what God wants us to be doing in that scenario, in that situation. Be slow to anger. And yet, we must not forget that there is a righteous anger. There is a righteous anger. Hebert, quote, The person who is never aroused and deeply stirred, or if you please, angry, the person who is never aroused and deeply stirred at evil is gravely deficient in moral character. Now that's something to think about. How much filth can you put up with without saying enough is enough? What is it? Pornography and what it's doing to marriages and to the minds and hearts of, I was going to say men, but it's also women. Abortion and what it's doing. When do we speak out? When do we act? When do we say enough is enough? What is it? The filthy words, I can remember working in the warehouse. I can remember just sharing this Jesus that you're cussing about and so forth. He's my Savior. He's my God. I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't take his name in vain. You know, sometimes people will pour it on even more. But sometimes it may cause them to think. You've heard on the golf course, so many people, they don't even realize what they're saying. It's the only vocabulary they know showing themselves very diminished in being able to speak. But to recognize there is a righteous anger. There is a righteous anger. Yes, the object must be right. It must be sin that we're angry and upset with, not the sinner. Yes, to love the sinner, to pray for the sinner, to be wise in how to witness or maybe just keep my mouth shut. Every situation is different, and I, for one, definitely mess it up at times. But does it disturb us that they are going to hell? It may be an enemy, one who treats you better. They're going to hell. Do I want that? No. The object must be right, and the expression of our anger must be in a godly way. For us to lose control doesn't help. But to express our anger, that that's wrong. That's wrong what you're saying. That's wrong what you're doing. That's wrong how you're treating someone. I need to speak out. I need to act. I need to do something. Yes, I need to be, as Hebert said, aroused and deeply stirred at evil and then to respond in a godly way. Be quick to hear. Be slow to speak. Be slow to anger. And finally, receive the word. Receive the word with proper preparation. Let's go back to verse 18. I promised we were going to do that. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth. He birthed us. Remember, he born again you. He brought us forth by the word of truth. By the word of truth. The word is seed. The parable of the soils and the the sower there as he sows the seed. It's the word of God that goes out. That word is implanted. Notice verse 21. Receive the word implanted. That which goes into the soil. That goes into a heart that is ripe and ready. Goes into your soul, your heart, as you are preparing to even hear the message today. Even after we're saved, we still need that seed of the word. To continue to grow. I remind you again, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3, break up the fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. 
It's been neat driving here through Lancaster County and to see the beautiful soil as the plows have done their job, as the, I want to say, harrows, those wheels <laughs> go across and they smooth it out. It's ready to, proceeds to be planted. It's gorgeous. That has to be done within our hearts. The harder the heart, the more preparation that needs to take place. The Lord Jesus said, take care how you listen. Take care how you listen, Luke 8, 18. That is after saying, the one who has ears to hear, let him hear. But then take care how you listen. You've got the ears, listen. Coming to church, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 1, it says this. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God. Maybe, maybe some of you are not ready to come back to the house of God. But if you're listening this morning, in a sense it's the house of God. No, it's not the same. But guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen. I didn't say go to the refrigerator now for, oh, I'm sorry, it was a cup of coffee. Draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know they are doing evil. Yes, to listen with proper heart preparation. I shared with you, I, I like to come early to a service, at least five minutes when we're on vacation, and just to quiet myself, to get rid of the distraction out there. No, I'll talk to you later, but not right now. I, I want to get my heart ready. I'm here to worship and to meet with God. It's not always the easiest to shift gears with everything pressing or just experienced on the outside. But prepare the soil. Prepare for the word. I can remember I've done some painting of new houses are definitely easier to paint than old houses. And I've painted a number of old houses in my day. And up on the ladder that I don't like being on anymore, but up on the ladder and on an old house and scraping. When have I scraped enough? The more I scrape, the more it comes off sometimes. Sometimes you have to get down to the bare wood. The painting's the easiest part, I find. But to get it ready, same with my heart, to scrape away. Because we're told some specifics here in a moment. With proper preparation, you notice what James says here. He shares here, therefore putting aside all filthiness. Filthiness, putting aside. That language, it's, it's the uh, take off and put on language he uses. It's the dirty clothes. It's yeah, me, when I used to do my own oil changes. and Remember, I would lose the plug in the bottle so it would overflow and the oil would be all over me. And That was just the other day again. I guess it was today. And I came in all sweaty. Diana said, take off the... Take it off. Take it off. That's what he's talking about here. Putting aside all filthiness. The filthiness, the word itself, it's referred to uncleanness of ulcers or sweating like I did this afternoon, or even it's used of wax in the ear. How appropriate. Receive the word. Be quick to hear. Wax in the ear. No, that doesn't help me in hearing. And so I need to get rid of it. And, and then he goes on to share, uh, not only there the um, filthiness, but all that remains of wickedness. That which is malignant, evil, anything inconsistent with Christian purity. It's the trash that we took in before we got saved. That's that old stuff that shouldn't stick around because we're getting rid of it. May I remind you that partial purity is no purity? Partial purity is no purity and impure we are. But praise God for the blood of Jesus as we continue to confess our sins, putting aside preparation. But also notice what he says here. Notice clearly, putting aside all filthiness, and all that remains of wickedness because I've plowed up the heart, I've gotten it soft, so in humility receive the word implanted. Humility, it's a teachable spirit. Do you have one? Can, can, can you say, Lord, I, I need to, I want to learn. Maybe I've heard this before. Maybe I need to rid myself of my preconceived conception as to what this means and understand that it's different or it's far deeper than what I was thinking. 
proper preparation, receive the word of God. But also to receive the word with faith. With faith. To admit the power of God's word into your life. Yes, it is there and it is able to. What does that say? The end of verse 21, look at it. Save your souls. And then to grow you. Colossians 2, 6, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, as you've received him by faith, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word, receive the word with faith, believing what God has said. Call upon the Lord and you will be saved. That's how you get saved. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I don't deserve goodness from you. I deserve hell. But you died for me because you love me. You love me. And you want me to be your child. And you've given promises. And by faith, I'm going to believe. The faith that you give me, I'm going to act upon. And take hold of. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. And I'm going to read a few verses there. Since you have an obedience... Since you have in obedience, 1 Peter 1, to the truth, the word, you've purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For, for you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but it's imperishable. It's good stuff. That is through the living and enduring word of God. And then for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. And we die so very quickly, don't we? But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. And this is the word that I'm preaching to you now. Yeah, you've heard it before. You've heard it before. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Receive the word. Basics. But this is the word which is preached to you. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Prepare the heart. Prepare the heart for the word to, to receive by faith. Then like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word. So that by it you may grow in respect to the salvation that you've obtained by faith. Yes, receive it by faith. Receive it. Take it in. And I remind you, if you're truly a child of God's, the life has to change. Do you want that change? The Lord has promised and he will bring it. He will bring it to you. It was back in the days of the Vietnam War when the North Vietnamese surrounded a U.S. infantry company on a hill that was not too far from the Cambodian border. There were driving sheets of rain like a monsoon coming down. Rifles were cracking nearby and the enemy was closing in. And a frightened GI hugged the ground in cold terror. All of a sudden, ripping through his chest and arm was a bullet. Robert Reinhold of the New York Times Service wrote this testimonial of the USGI. The bullet was slowed, I'm reading here, the bullet was slowed by a New Testament that the soldier was carrying in his shirt pocket. Ten years later, the young man still treasures the blood-stained book with a ragged hole through the middle. He believes that book saved his life. Did you hear me? He believed the book saved his life, but there was no indication ever that the book did more than that. There's no indication that by faith he took hold of that which James writes, it's able to save not just your body, from a Viet Cong bullet, but to save your soul. Yes, by faith, receive the word and allow it to grow within you as God changes you. That's Christianity. That's salvation. That's what God would have for every one of us. You can know this book in your head, you can love that book as writings and poetry and whatever. You can use it to deflect the bullet 
instead of armor. But what you need to do is allow it to save your soul. To save your soul. Yes, then you will have a growing relationship with God. And will be blessed. What does a humble heart do in response to this message? Remember that you live under Jesus, by Jesus, and for Jesus. This humility will make our three commands, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, accomplish their desired end as you receive his word. Don't underestimate the power of his word. Taking together, lighting your path, it will save your soul. Jesus, Lord.
Father, would you help us to remember those that profess to be saved, what it means to be born again, that there was something that died and that there was something that lives that uh, brings us to fellowship with you. The I can't, the I don't want to, the it's too hard. It doesn't, doesn't work there. To love you is to love righteousness and to hate wickedness. So would you help us, Father? Help us to, with humility, receive the word in plan, which is able to save our souls. Thank you for these reminders. Sink it to our deep into our hearts and to change our focus this week. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>